I was born in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, August 11, 1929, three centuries back. And uh, I had a brother that was younger than me here in three months. I had a sister a year older than me. Her name was Lori, Dolores Marilyn Young. And then my brother was Richard Bruce Young. And I was Horace Allen Young, named after my dad. And uh, but I, we were there you know, probably about uh, in Cleveland for probably a good eight years anyway. And then my dad decided that we should move out into the country. And uh, we did. And uh, we were, he bought a plot of land, two acre little farm land. It was narrow, but it went all the way back into the woods. And uh, he bought that land and then we started building. And he, he and my grandfather, George Grimes, and then my uncle also, they, they worked on the building. They, built the house and and we helped what we could do as kids and under the house after it was built they dug a basement and then we hauled all the dirt out with our wagons and they got rid of the dirt and my dad put blocks on both sides and then set the house on the blocks so you dug a basement after the house was built yeah yeah it was weird but that's what we did is that yeah. normal no <laughs> they usually have the the hole in the ground and then it put a foundation in down there, and then they put the house on top. But we did it different. Just decided afterwards you wanted a basement? Yeah. So you get, you were helping with that too? Yeah. When you were a kid? Yeah, we, we hauled the dirt out. The, the, all, well, both us boys did, yeah. So when did you guys move to Key West? Uh, when the war broke out in 1943, or 41, I mean, December 7th, and the president said we've had a dastardly attack on America in the Japanese imperial military has bombed and attacked Honolulu. Because of that, we were now at war. And so because we were at war, everybody knew they were going to be, they're going to have to have a call-up of all the guys to fight the war. So my uncle Bob knew that he was going to have to be called to, to fight. Even though he was married, he had no children. If he had no children, then you're going to get called up. And he got called up and uh, he joined the army and he be, went into the tank corps. And then my dad decided that since his brother signed up, even though he had us three kids, and I was already, I, when we got to Florida, I had just turned 13 on my birthday while we were driving down to Florida in a Model T. We, we went there because my dad had joined the Navy and he went in the Navy because of his brother and, and the fact that the country needed him and needed everybody. My mother drove us down to, Key, to Florida and roads at that time were just windy and really poor, and we didn't have, we had no main high, no big highways, no uh, interstate. We had no interstate highways, and they built those highways later so that they could move the, the troop equipment down to the coast or whatever to protect the coast and to go and to put it on the ships to take it overseas to fight the war. My dad, when he was in the Navy, was shipped over to Cuba. He spoke fluent Spanish. He, could, he knew Spanish really good. He had, been in the, he had joined the Merchant Marines when he was young. In the Merchant Marines, they spent a lot of time in Cuba, and so he learned Spanish really well. And so the Navy wanted him as an interpreter and translator. So they, uh, he, in Cuba, that's what he did. He got sick over there. He got, he got uh, malaria, and they had no hospital system worthwhile in Cuba, so they sent him to Key West because they had a naval hospital in Key West. And uh, so in Key West, uh, he was in the hospital, and then they told him that 
when he got uh, better, that they would let him stay in Key West. He wouldn't be sent overseas. So uh, that's when my mother decided to go ahead and load up the kids and come on down. So it was kind of by accident that you guys ended up in Key West? Yeah, really. So we got there, he got better, and the Navy didn't honor their comment. They turned around and put him, sent him back up to Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia to board a new ship, which was the USS Wilkes-Barre from Pennsylvania, named after Pennsylvania. So anyway, we were in Key West and I went to Key West High School. And So what was it like as a teenager moving across the country? Were you sad to leave your friends or were you excited? Well, my mother was glad because she didn't like a couple of the boys that we lived by. And it was nice though, we, on the farm, I really enjoyed it. I think I got the appreciation for hard work on the farm. We bought a cow, a horse, chickens, pigs, many ducks, many, many, uh, a lot of chickens. And uh, we had uh, uh, other animals, we had a goat and the whole nine yards. We boys, when my dad left, we had to feed them, you know. We had to, and I was, anyway, because my dad was working six and seven days a week. He worked for the railroad in, in Ohio, and he did a lot in, delivering stuff and stuff like that. But he uh, was gone an awful lot, and so I, I was responsible for milking the cow. And uh, I, my favorite thing to do was cats would come up when I, or dogs would come up when I was milking the cows, and, and uh, I'd squeeze those teats and, and uh, shoot them in the face, and they'd lick their chops, and I, that was my favorite thing to do. The rest of the milk I took into the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that you said you tried your hand at raising some of your own livestock. You were telling me before uh -huh. when you were a kid, you said you raised chickens. I was going to be an entrepreneur <laughs> at a young age. So I bought a hundred chicks and they were doing really well. But then we got some kind of a disease that hit the chickens, hit the farms. When it hit the farms, I lost all but three dozen of my chicks. And so I was out of business in chicken farming. But, but well, I enjoyed that. And I had them, you know, they were coming along fine until they That happened in one season? Pardon? That happened in one season? You bought them and they all died in the same yeah, season? they all yeah. died pretty quick. So I had three, three dozen and, and I never wanted to kill it, the, any of the animals anyway. So my dad had to do that until he left. And I don't, I don't remember who killed him after that, you know. So, so I wanna, I wanna paint a picture of what it was like growing up in Olmsted Falls, mm -hmm. like in the house. Um, you know, what was the bathroom like? Taking showers and baths. Did you share a bedroom? Sure. Well, in our new house, our insulation in the walls was magazines and newspapers. We didn't have any professional stuff that that we put into the walls. And we had one stove in the middle of the a house, and it put heat on throughout the house because it wasn't that big, you know, at first. We just loved the farm, and we enjoyed the, the neighborhood kids, even though my mother didn't like a couple of them because a couple of them were, oh, they were a little older, and they were teaching us bad habits and stuff like that, things we... But we... Uh, Used to play out in the outside. The neighborhood kids were farms, so a little distance between each one. Thank goodness, uh, there was some distance between them. And uh, but we got a lot of exercise, and we worked hard. And each of us had some chores to help my mother when Dad was gone, when he was gone. And so we were there a while after he left. I don't know, one crazy thing I remember is that my mom used to wake us up for, to go to the pot. We had a two-hole outside, two-holer we called it, outside, and we had to go outside all seasons to to use the bathroom. And so she'd wake me up, and I'd go on out and and use it and come back into the house. But one time I 
I was out quite a while, and my mother was worried about me. We slept nude. We were naked as jaybirds, you know. And uh, we, and she, she was worried about me, so she went to the door and she saw that the moon was bright, and it, and I was shining as I was walking, not to the bathroom, but to the, my friend's house, the girlfriend. She was my girlfriend. I really liked her. She's a pretty girl. And uh, so I was walking towards her house, and she, my mother says, where are you going, Alan? I says, over to Virginia's house, because we did go over there a lot. You know, I worked on their farm a lot, worked on the different farms, sputted potatoes at one farmer, and I hauled wheat up into the granary on another farm. And so anyway, I was headed to Virginia's house. She says, Alan, turn around, come on, back home. Okay, Mom. So I spun around, and I went back, did my business, and came, came back in the house. And I remember another incident that was very frustrating to me. You know, I was the middle child. I mean, I had that younger brother. Oh, he was so cute and sweet and blonde and me, I just me. And then my sister, well, naturally, she was a girl, so she got the shot. She got, we had a big tub. My mother would fill it with water. We had to get their water, go outside and pump the pump, put some water in the pump to kind of prime it and then pumped the water in so she could get water into, into the big pot. She'd fill it with cold water from the pump outside. After it was filled up, she, she had boiled some water, and she put that water in the pot and warm it up a little bit. So she bathed my sister, take care of her, and get her all squared away, because we did it once a week on Saturday night, always, because we went to church on Sunday Methodist Church. You would bathe once a week? Pardon? You, be, you would take a bath once a week? Once a week on Saturday nights, we'd take our bath. And uh, so she bathed my sister, got her all squared away, and then she'd leave. And then the next one was my sweet younger brother, because he was so sweet and cuddly. And, and I was paranoid because I had to get into the tub last, and the floating is the dirt and the water. And I was. We'd be bathing, bathing in my brother and sister's dirt, and that always frustrated me. But uh, but I, I think I got paranoid over that. So you got one bath a week, and then the bath you did get was the leftovers from your siblings. Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Were there any any significant injuries or illnesses in your family when you were a kid? Not really. I did. I did have a real serious problem uh, with. Uh, I had a major infection because I did not get a. Oh, what do they call that uh, when they take the foreskin of the kid off and circumcision? Circumcision. I hadn't had a circumcision when I was first born, and so it was about ten years old, and I had a major infection, and they didn't have any doctors around, and so. There was a horse doctor, that's what they called him, a horse doctor, and he did the surgery, and of course I had problems later because of that, but he was able to take off the foreskin and then, and then I got better. You had that done when you were 10 years old? Yeah, yeah. You, that was, was, it tra tra was it traumatizing? I was in the hospital for a week. It was really traumatizing, yeah. Oh man. No fun. That's the only major thing I think any of us had, really. What about your parents? I know your dad was in the military, but what about when you were a kid? What did they do for work? Well, my dad, uh, he had a variety of jobs. At first, he was hauling uh, milk around in a milk wagon pulled by a horse. And uh, he would stop at people's houses and deliver milk. He hated that job, but he had to saddle up his, I mean, put it, rig his horse up, you know, and into the wagon, and the, and then he had to follow it. Another thing he did was uh, he sold ice, so because back then we had ice boxes. It's a box where you, you'd you wrap your pay, big blocks of ice you'd buy, and then you'd put it in your freezer, but you'd wrap it with newspaper so it would last longer and it would uh, not melt as fast. But later he got a job with the railroad, and uh, even before that, he got a job with my grandfather. 
So anyway, he was selling cars and he he was making a little bit of money. He was making not, not making a lot of money. But then my mother and he, he got contacted by a salesman for magazines. So this was earlier. This was when I was just about two years old. But anyway, he hired 40 girls, and my mother was the chaperone, and he was the salesperson. And he would sell magazines door to door. And we were in the Depression. I didn't mention that, but the Depression was, in fact, I was blamed for starting the Depression because I was born in August of 1929, and the Depression, world's greatest depression, hit everybody. And guys were jumping off of off of buildings and off of bridges and killing themselves, and it's it really a bad deal. But he was uh, selling magazines, and he was making pretty decent money at that time. And he traveled all over Ohio, and then, so they left us, and we lived with our grandparents. I forgot that story. And he lived with our grandparents for quite a while, two, a couple of years. We didn't see our parents. And uh, because then when they finished going around in Ohio, then they went west and they went to Illinois and Indiana and sold in those states. And then they went north up into Canada and uh, they sold in the Canadian communities up above the lakes, Great Lakes. So they went across Canada and all the way to Niagara Falls. Then they dropped back down into the States and then came back to Cleveland. And my grandmother told them, she says, Horace, I raised my kids. It's your turn to raise your kids. And so they, they stopped and they sent the girls off to their homes. And, but he was doing pretty good during the Depression. And uh, if, if somebody couldn't pay for something, he would barter with them. He, they'd, fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. And so try to help so that way the kids could all eat. And if the kids were all 15 to 18, something like that. And then, then, then when he was told he had to stay home, then it, that's when he went on the railroad. And uh, but then the war broke out and that's where we ended up going to Key West. So what were your, what were your thoughts as a kid? Let's see, you would have been 12 when Pearl Harbor happened? Yeah, Around I was 12. About 12? Yeah, I was 12. I, I, and then uh, it was on my 13th birthday we headed for Key West. Do you remember hearing the news of Pearl Harbor? Did you have any uh, impressions of that as a kid? Yeah. In fact, all of us had, it seemed like we all had a big radio because that was our communication back then. And with the radio, we would lay on the floor and we'd listen to the news. And that's when President Roosevelt made his announcement about the war starting. And, and uh, so that was when my dad went ahead and went and left and went in the Navy. So when you were 13, you moved down to Key West. Do you have any memories of any fun memories of growing up on the base during your teenage years? Yeah, fun memories. Because when he was in the hospital, uh, my mother went to work, because she had to, because everybody had to work back then. The ladies, had to, most of them either had to work or were raising their kids. But she went to work in the Navy base. And that way, we were eligible to move into the Navy housing. And uh, in the housing, it was really nice. It was, uh, we were right by the base gate. And uh, some of our best friends were the Marines at the guard guard shack there at the gate in, in Key West. And we used to, they had a nice swimming pool. So I was a AAA rated swimmer by the time we left Key West uh, because I was trained by the Navy guys. The, I got the same training as the sailors got, you know, went on the ships. Our, sh our island, Key West, was surrounded with submarines. The ships were there, and they had a Navy base and an Army Air Corps base. Nightly, we had regularly, we had to pull our shades down because the submarines, German and Italian submarines, were all over the Atlantic. 
I mean, they, they, during the war, they sunk 26 of our ships along that coast and down in the Gulf of Mexico. And so the Navy in Key West was charged with the responsibility for elimination of the submarines of the German and Italian navies. And uh, their ships didn't, of course, didn't get in close because our submarines would have got them. So but the submarines were all over the place. And they parked at Key West, so we had them just all around. As a kid, I used to sell ice cream to the, to the people on the submarines. I would throw the ice cream up to the guys on the deck in the submarine. They'd throw their nickels down. Occasionally, sometimes a nickel would go into the drink, and they'd throw another nickel. And occasionally, ice cream bar would go into the, into the drink, <laughs> and then I, I'd have to throw another ice cream bar up. So, but I made pretty decent money, you know, during the, during that time, and yeah, just doing that. We and then my brother and I, we had used carts. We had regular ice cream carts with wheels, and we pushed those around the island, and we sold our ice cream. And, and uh, I also sold coconuts. I used to, I was, I liked to just wear shorts all the time. I was almost black. I was really dark because I constantly was was out in the sun. And I built a raft, and uh, I we would go out into the swamps on the raft and that kind of stuff. And when I, when I was about 15, I built a 15-foot skiff, which is a small boat. And I built it with a V bottom. That way it was not rocky in the water. And uh, I was real proud of it, I loved it. I had to warp, take them, warp the boards to make them all fit in right. And I used to get around the island regularly. I did what they call skull oar, which is at the back of the boat instead of with the two oars. I could, I could skull oar the boat as fast as a guy could do it with two oars. So I went around the island, and I went into the Gulf, and I just had a lot of fun. I loved Key West, and Key West was a great place to live. How did you learn how to make a boat? Oh, I would have read read up on it, you know, so, so to, to make it. And it was a good little craft. I was real disappointed when I came back after I got in the Army and found out that the family had broke it all up and used it for firewood so that they could have a Weenie roast. <laughs> that was frustrating. But I knew that they would never use it again, and my brother could care less, you know. Yeah, it was we, just your passion. Yeah, we learned water skiing down there. We used barrel staves for skis because we didn't have any water skis. So, you know, barrel staves is kind of curved, and we would ski on, on our barrel staves, hold on to some ropes, and go. Speaking of, you mentioned going in the swamps earlier, and that brought up a story that that reminded me of. You told me there was a story involving a swamp and some military weapons. Oh, that that's, that's an interesting story. Uh, yeah, we were bored as far as our mothers were working all day. The war was really raging. We had 100,000 sailors around the island. And their next stop would have been from the Key West out into the Pacific or Atlantic, and they'd be out in, in combat. And Key West was charged with the responsibility. It, it became a battle zone. We officially declared a battle zone. And our we, aircraft were crashing, uh, and uh, we had uh, sirens going all the time, and uh, we had searchlights going up into the sky on a regular basis. And we, we actually had uh, one Zeppelin, Navy Zeppelin, that always flew around the two islands, Key West and the next one up, Boca Chica. And they flew around constantly and uh, uh, just watching for submarines so they didn't get in too close to the islands. Because of that, my mother working all day, and then in the e evening, my Aunt Jean had come down from Cleveland to live with, with our family. She was a little older than my sister, so they were the best buds. 
and they were old enough to go into the USO, which is the United Service Organization, but the sailors and soldiers could go into the USO and they could dance and the ladies felt an obligation to go and do that dancing because they knew those guys would never come back, a lot of them. They'd be going out into the war zones and they were all going to board their submarines and those submarines got sunk regularly also. Well, we were all by ourselves a lot. So I... I was always an organizer for some reason or other. And there was about 15 of us kids. We were having fun, enjoying ourselves. And so we got a little bit carried away. My brother and I, with our little carts, were going around the Navy base. And we spotted a window that was open, looked in it, and there were a bunch of guns in there. And so we thought, well, it's okay. The window's open. And we just went ahead and loaded our little carts with some guns. We ended up with 43 pistols and three submachine guns and one. <laughs> Bunch of children. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Selling ice cream and getting guns and so yeah, We didn't mean any harm. We were just going to play, you know, as kids do. You know, we fired them into the ocean and stuff. We fire, fired them out in the swamps, and we enjoyed them. And then one day, and there were 15 of us kids, they were organized, and one day, one of the mothers wondered why we were always going out into the swamps. Fifteen kids following me, <laughs> my brother, and uh, going out into the swamps. And Well, she wondered what in the world they could be doing out there, so she finally went out there one time when we weren't there. She found these stacks of coral rock. Well, we, we had a couple of trash cans. We kept our weapons in the trash cans, we dug a holes, two holes to put the trash cans down in. We kept all our guns in in those trash cans. This is crazy, I know, but but anyway, we enjoyed playing with the guns, and you know, kids love guns. And so, uh, when she went out and saw those, she wondered if we buried somebody. She thought we'd killed somebody and buried them there. <laughs> And she reported it to the police. And the police came out and they dug, dug the coral rock because we covered them with coral rock when we finished out there. When, she, when they, the police dug them out and they found all those guns, there wasn't a body, it was all of our weaponry. So anyway, the police reported it to the Navy because they were Navy weapons, you know. All of us went under a bright light and we were grilled. And they decided we'd all come from good homes, but our dads and all were off on ships or submarines and they were gone. So they decided that uh, it was a disgrace to the U.S. Navy. The Navy, unfortunately, and my mother was furious, they, they kicked, me, kicked us off the base. And, uh, they took kicked my, you off the base because of the guns? Yeah, and they decided, yeah, we came from good families, but we shouldn't have done what we did. They got all the guns recovered except three. A couple of the guys, they had them at their house and they threw them in the ocean. They never found them. They, I'm sure they took, they nailed a few sailors responsible for security on that building, you know. But uh, anyway, that was how that turned out. And it was never held against me at all. Never held against any of us, so. But you got kicked off the base? Yeah. The housing? My mother, un, because it was really nice housing on the base, so we moved out with the place where they called Boca Chica. No, Poinciana, Poinciana was. When we first went to Key West, that's where we were at Poinciana before we, before we moved into the air base. So. so that was the end of that wonderful story. I'd love to hear the story about how in your late teens, you ended up joining the military. What made you want to join the military? There were, as I mentioned before, we were right there by the gate, and there were four Marines that handled, handled the gate for people coming in and out of the base. <clears throat> and uh, those four Marines were our best friends. We hung out at the guard shack, and so we were best of friends. One of them even dated my aunt and ended up marrying her 
after the war. And my sister dated uh, one of the sailors also. We were best of friends, and these four Marines had already fought battles, and they lived through it. And then they came back and served in Key West. So we were for best friends. I was inspired by all the Navy guys. They all had to wear their uniforms. Everywhere on the base was guys in uniform. 100,000 off of their ships. They lived on their ships, submarines. So as kids, I, I really loved the, what the military was doing. And it was, everybody was patriotic in World War II. Everybody, everybody was willing to do their part during the war. And uh, so I, my brother and I were the same way. We, we decided that we really wanted to serve the military. I tried to went to the recruiter when I was 16, and uh, they turned me down. They said, you're going to have to go back and eat some more <clears throat> and get a little older. Because I was only, golly, 109 pounds when I went into the military. I went ahead and said that I was going to stay 20 years because I, I loved what the guys were doing, what the GIs were doing. We watched, we got to see what they were doing, you know, working on their ships. And in fact, one time when I was 16, I decided I was going to leave Key West, and I didn't tell my mother. My dad wasn't home. He was out on his ship. And uh, I was going to go up to St. Petersburg, up in northern central Florida, and uh, get a job, and, and I told my brother to keep it secret, don't tell mom, and uh, don't tell my girlfriend. Well, I walked all the way from Key West, all the way up the coast, up through the Indian lands, mosquitoes as big as you can believe, uh, were huge. And then I uh, got to St. Pete, I worked for six weeks, you walked from Key West to St. Petersburg? Yeah, I got little rides occasionally, but most of it I walked all the way up there. And uh, I just, uh, I, I was wanting adventure. I wanted, I was always a hyperactive kid, you know, I always wanted to do something that I, that I could move on. And so I got up there, I worked for six weeks. Somebody ratted on me. And I uh, told my mother, she called me, she says, Alan, either, either you come on back to Key West, hop on a bus, because I had a good job. I was working at the, the great big giant store. And uh, either you come back to Key West on your own, by the bus, or the police will bring you home. <laughs> And of course, they probably wouldn't have, but anyway, that's what she threatened me, is, and I believed it. So I went back to Key West. Then uh, <clears throat> the war was nearing the end, and uh, it was in the last stages of the battle going on, and in a lot of places, the battle had already stopped. Uh, that, so I wanted to go in. I wanted to be a part of going overseas so I could let the guys that were over there come back home. They'd been out there fighting for three years, you know, three or four years. And I got permission from my mother to join the military. I went in, and about that time my dad got home from his ship. He was hurt, he was bad off. He, he lost his ears, he lost his eyes as a result of combat, shooting the big, huge, 20-foot guns that kick back fire and kick back smoke. And anyway, I, <clears throat> I decided to go. She approved it, and my dad approved it. And if mom approved it, then that was okay. Dad would approve it. So, because I wanted to go really bad. <clears throat> and she saw that, I could tell that by the time I went to St. Pete, you know, that I wanted to get gone. I went to the recruiter, he sent me to, because I, I couldn't go in the Navy because I had a broken eardrum once and it was healed, and, but they didn't want to accept that. And so somebody said, we'll try the Army. So I went on the bus and got orders to go up to the base in Coral Gables. And uh, I was interviewed by the people there, I was went through the physical, 
And the, uh, the medic said, and I, I, I didn't want to go back to Key West now. I be, you know, I, I'm going in the military, I'm going into service, all my friends, and, and, and I dropped out of school to do that. I got up there, <clears throat> the Navy corpsman that, that checked me out, <clears throat> he says, you're okay, except that you're spo you have to be 120 pounds. You only weigh 109 pounds. And I said, well, golly. He could tell I was about to cry because I wanted to go in so bad. I dare not go back to Key West. All my friends would mock me, you know, and I was already had a complex anyway because I was so skinny. He said, look, kid, go downtown, get you a stock of bananas, a whole stock, and get you a gallon of water, drink all that water, eat all those bananas, you come back tomorrow morning. So, <laughs> okay, Sergeant, and... I, so I came back in the morning. He weighed me in, and I weighed 119 pounds, and I had to weigh 120. <laughs> I looked, because they stripped us off, you know, when we took our physicals. And, and he, he, he said, look, kid, I'm going to give you a pound. So you got 120 pounds. With that extra pound, I got in the military, sworn into the U.S. Army Air Corps, U.S. Army Air Force. And uh, so then I, I was in. Three months later, I weighed 135 pounds, you know. So you know, I'd really worked out and you know, that kind of stuff. And so, what was what was it like having him back after your whole teenage years of him being away? It was great. It was good to have him back and safe and sound. And but I was still ready to go, you know, because I had just turned 17. And uh, and I was committed to go to the military, so yeah. But but he but he survived well because he learned how to lip read, and uh, so he could still talk and lip read. So he knew everything that was going on. And on the island, he spoke Spanish and he spoke English, and so he got a real good job and uh, with the Navy. And uh, in fact, he was a supervisor, had big operation because he learned very rapidly how to read lips. Did you have a good relationship with your dad? Yeah, yeah, I got along good with my dad. He was, he was easygoing, and he was, my dad was a good guy. He had his problems, but he was a good guy. Uh, so once you're in the military, where, where was the first place they sent you? Uh, they sent me to Fort, uh, to camp uh, up in North Carolina. Uh, they were training paratroopers there, and uh, it was really popular for paratroopers. I was there for three months. I got, shortly after I got in the service, uh, I got in in October, and in December I had, well, I got real sick, and they let me go home for two months, two weeks uh, while I recuperated, and, and it took me about a, a month to, to get better. And uh, mononucleosis is what I had. What were, I know we... You have so much military history, and we probably can't get into everything just yeah. with how much there is. But what were, I guess, what were some challenges of being in the military? Maybe something you didn't expect, something that was difficult? Well, it was interesting because I, in high school, I hated math. And I felt a failure, you know, and uh, that's why I dropped out. I was glad to drop out and go into service. And because uh, I was hyper and... It, once I was in the military, I loved it. I was shipped from Fort Bragg to San Antonio, Texas, where I went into basic training. And I took basic training that was for four months and uh, learned all the military stuff. That's when I picked up my weight. And we had we did a 50-mile walk with, with 50 pounds or 75 pounds on our back, you know. And we'd walk through water, then they'd shoot gas at us. And then we'd have to throw our gas mask on how fast. If we didn't get it on fast enough, we'd start bawling, you know. And uh, we learned all about weaponry. We knew how to take care of our guns and all that kind of stuff. After I finished basic, for basic training, heavy exercise, a lot of exercise. We were ordered to get out of the, in the morning, the sergeant would come in and he'd, you know, anyway, they give you the belt reveille, and we'd bounce up, and they give us 16 seconds to get from the second floor out and in dressed from bed in formation. 
if we didn't make it, which we didn't at first, but after a while we got to where we could pull up our long johns, get out there, and be in formation by 16 seconds. Finished all the basic training then, and it was rough. Basic training wasn't easy. A lot of exercising. It was good for us, you know. But uh, then they sent, they sent me to, to uh, another base uh, in San Antonio. This was in San Antonio. The first training was in San Antonio. Then the when medical training was in San Antonio. And I was doing great. I was passing everything. I was getting high marks in all school. It really opened my head up and realized that I really wasn't what I thought I was in Key West, you know. Then I went to, uh, they asked me if I wanted to go into a pharmacy training, advanced training into pharmacy. So I said, sure, yeah. So I got into pharmacy. I was in there doing well. And I met this girl at the pool, uh, Hazel Murray McDonald, really nice gal, and, and fell madly in love, of course. After two months of training in the pharmacy, they called us all in and they said, look, we know that not everybody can live 20, uh, tw uh, eight hours a day cooped up in a little room pumping drugs, you know, and handing out medications and stuff like that. That was me. Right. I didn't want to be tied up in a small room. I was grateful they gave us an opportunity to get out. I had to say goodbye to Hazel Murray, and that was all over because I was shipped up to Smoky Hill. I was there for, uh, I, when I first got there, I was on the floor with the nurse and and uh, patients on the floor and helping the nurse. And she says, well, young, why don't you go on down and give this lady a shot in room such and such? Okay, I I was trained with a shooting into an orange. That was my training with giving a shot. So anyway, I went down to the room. I figured, well, surely she'll just pull up her sleeve and I'll give her a shot in the arm. Instead, the lady was probably, she, to me, I, it's, I was still 17. And in my estimation, in her 50s, and I think she was probably in her 50s, I figured she was ancient, you know, that's old, somebody <laughs> that old. So anyway, instead of me giving her a shot in the arm, she turned around and pulled her branches down. <laughs> I gave her a shot in the butt. That was, I wasn't ready to face that, you know, I was shocked. But anyway, I, I did that. And then right after that, they called me from supply, uh, medical supply. They said, because I had experience in pharmacy that would I mind going into supply because I knew medical terms and I knew a lot of the medications. You know, I used to make, we made medication back then. So I agreed to go into supply and I was really in love with that. I was a, in supply for probably a, a year there and uh, we had a bad experience. My friend, Herbert Gilbert, he and I decided a good place to meet young women might be a church. So we were going to go to church in town. And uh, we didn't have a car, but there was a sergeant that had a car. And uh, we called him and said, Sarge, can, can we borrow your car to go to church? He says, sure, young, come on over and get the keys. And so we went over and got the keys, picked them up from him. There was a witness there that saw us get the keys from him. And uh, we got in the car and we drove down to the city, Salina, Kansas. And in en route, just barely out of the base, cops with the lights on and the siren pulled us over, two vehicles. And... Uh, they had guns pointed at us, and they said, come with us. One of them, one of them uh, had uh, one of us drive the car, the cop with us, and the other one was in the cop car. So it was one car. And uh, they drove us to the police station, and we, so we ended up in bunks with real hard criminals. I mean, there were some killers in there. There was 
There was just really bad guys. I had a I had a little nasal because I always had block sinuses, and so I had a little nasal thing. I sniff it, and the guy grabbed it out of my hand. One of the prisoners, he smashed it, and it was on the floor with his sh shoes, and uh, he took the little. There's a little white thing in there, and he cut it up into pieces and gave it to about five guys. And uh, they chewed on it, and they started playing cards. And the next morning, they were still playing cards wide awake from chewing on that little thing that was in the in <laughs> my snifter. So you, you gave them a good night? <laughs> yeah, I gave them. They had a good time. Uh, that was good. We didn't have to listen to anything else but let them over there playing cards, you know. So that was okay. But the next morning, then, we went... Uh, Went, uh, we were called before the judge and and and, and the inspectors, and they, we told them the story. We were disappointed because, I mean, we were going to church to meet some people, girls if necessary, if available. And uh, we didn't get to do that. So, but they, they st checked the story out and they found the witness, saw us get the keys. They had a witness that heard me talk to the sergeant about getting the keys, and so we were we were okay. It came out in the city newspaper, front page of course, because in Salina, Kansas, they did not like military guys. I guess they were probably marrying off their girls and getting moving, you know. But anyway, we got back to the base, and the commander said, Look, young, I know this is embarrassing for you and Gilbert, and if you'd like, we can give you a transfer off the base, or you can stay here. Transfer off the base, go overseas. Woo-hoo, that's exactly what I wanted. So we, uh, we uh, took the option to go overseas. So Herb and I were on our way. We, we left three weeks later, we were on our way overseas, and that's when I went to Guam. And I know that, just jumping ahead a little bit, I know that Guam is where you met your first wife. Right. So how did what was that story? How did that happen? Key West was all torn apart. They'd been bombed by the Japanese in 41. They were taken over by the Japanese in 41. In 40. Four, when we went in there, my dad was actually shooting the big guns on the, the island. And uh, they were firing, and then they were bombing it, and there were, you know, all kinds of aircraft strafing and stuff like that. And so they were tearing up Key West, which they did. Uh, the Key West uh, was off limits to the GIs who could not go into the villages. They were, they were off limits. All villages were off limits. I was there for a better part of a year. But while I was there, you so you had no contact with women on the island. When you guys wanted to date, you know, they wanted to, but they couldn't do it. It was not allowed. Some of the girls did work at the base supply office where I would pick up my supplies. I was a PFC, lowest rank, next to, next to number, it was number one level. My buddy Herb was also same level. He was hired to go into the administrative department. I was hired to go into supply. This girl was a beautiful girl, uh, Maria Monabusen. She was from uh, one of the villages, and she was from Lijang, Barragata. She worked in the supply office where I was coming in to order my supplies or pick my supplies up. I met her because she was working there, so and I, I kept noticing how attractive, you know. And it wasn't maybe five months before we, I went home. And uh, so, but, and the guys were egging me on, Young, why don't you ask her for a date? And because if I had a date, I could ask for permission to go into the village, and I'd meet her family, and I could date her. So I got brave, and I says, Maria, would you... Want to date me? And she says, yeah, I would. So so anyway, we dated, and uh, I got to go into the village and uh, met all of her family. She had nine or ten brothers and sisters, all great people. 
I really don't want them. They all speak English over there because it's a, it was an, a protectorate at the time of the U.S. So anyway, I uh, dated her. But every time I dated her, I had to have a chaperone. And uh, then the GIs, you know, they're excited because I was dating her, a, a, a woman. <laughs> and and so, so I... So I was all excited, and and they were my GIs. All they had to do was sit on the floor when, once a month when they got their their income. They'd salute, and the lieutenant would hand them their monthly pay, and they'd sit down and they'd gamble all their money away. And uh, I didn't want to do that. I didn't, and I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't. I didn't want to do any of those things. And so anyway. I went ahead and and uh, they kept saying, "Why don't you Why don't you take her back to the states, marry her, and take her back to the states?" Well, okay, she was pretty and she was nice and friendly and very efficient in her work, and and so I proposed to her and she agreed to to marry me, and so we went. We married. They had a big big fandango. They had a pig with apple in his mouth and all the big, all the village. And my buddy from the base was able to come. And I married her, we come back, we boarded the ship and they gave us private quarters in the, on the ship and to go home. And in fact, on the way home, we ran into a horrible typhoon. A typhoon turned around and hit Guam and really devastated it. But it devastated our ship too. Our ship was going like this. We were right in the middle of a typhoon. And finally we made it through the typhoon, come back to the States, and all was well. So yeah. what was it like being back in the States with her? We we had problems right off the start. Uh, because I was supply sergeant, and at the next base I went to it was Tampa, Florida, MacDill Air Force Base. So we were given the option when we re-enlisted, we went to go into the Air Force or stay Army. And I decided, new challenge. I love challenges. And uh, so I accepted the Air Force. I joined the Air Force as of that time. So, yeah, on the base, I was assigned to two squadrons. I just uh, was busy as could be. My wife was on the phone regularly calling and at first, I just, well, she just called. She wanted me, wanted me to be, I was busy, really working hard. And uh, to, to maintain those two squadrons, I had to maintain, I make sure that they were war, ready for war, you know, to get out of there. And uh, so she kept calling and hanging up and calling and hanging up and calling and hanging up, not saying anything. Or she would tie up the line for quite a while and not say anything. My GIs that worked for me were protecting me. I was a sergeant by then, and she was, they were protecting me and uh, didn't report, you know, any th in my, it was an infraction. It was an interruption of a war effort. And uh, so uh, they, so I just realized that I had a real big problem because if I, if I got caught, uh, with this happening, it could it could be serious. I could lose my my job as a supply sergeant, which I didn't want to do. So anyway, I uh, she got real homesick. After about just about a year and a half, she got real homesick. It was expensive to send her back to Guam. We weren't making much money in those days. Very little, in fact, under a hundred hundred dollars a month, you know. And uh, so anyway, she uh, uh, I needed to go back to Guam, and so uh, so I decided to send her. Well, she was pregnant at the time, so Bob was was born in Guam. She was Jackie was born there in Tampa, and uh, and uh, oh. It was wonderful with Jackie. I hated giving her up, you know, but I knew I could not continue 
having that. She was not adjusting to the States at all. She had no friends, you know. So she went back with Jackie to Guam. And of course, she did not forgive me for a long time. I divorced her probably shortly after she went back to Guam. I knew that it was not going to work. She later remarried another GI, and it worked out really good. She, when she would come back the second time, she made the major adjustment, and she was okay in that marriage. So I was happy about that. Did you end up having relationships with your kids with her? Uh, she would not allow me to see Jackie, period. And uh, I didn't see Jackie until she was an adult. I visited Jackie, California, Florida, Maine, many other places and throughout the country. But I never, she, was, she never came to my, our home. I visited Bob regularly quite a bit. She didn't mind Bob visiting me, but she, she knew that Jackie was the one that I was primarily, you know, really had a strong tie to. I had to, one with Bob too, but it was different, you know, because so just not being able to see her. So anyway, it was an unfortunate situation and I felt real bad about it. But I knew that she was in good care on Guam because uh, family all over, you know, a lot of family, they were loving, caring, good people. And so they, they would look out for her. And later she moved to, to Florida when I was in Florida. No, New Mexico, she moved to New Mexico when I was in New Mexico. And Jackie did sneak over one time and I got to see her, but that's the only time, all the time she was growing up. So I know after Guam you you went to Japan, right? Right. So I'm not sure if we have enough time to get into everything about Japan, but do you have maybe a memory or two of? Uh, uh, the Korean War was going on then. I volunteered to go to Korea because my buddies were all over there. It's crazy, but I did. They shipped me to Japan. I was still involved. I was in the Korean War. But I was in Japan in a radar station, 50 GIs, 200 miles north of Tokyo. We got our food once every two weeks by train, and we got our supplies by train. And I kept three radar st systems go operational during the Korean War. We were guiding aircraft back and forth between Korea and Japan. That was my, our, our operation. But I was stationed in Hironomachi, Japan, and I really loved that, and loved the people, and uh, they're wonderful people. And uh, I had my car over there because I was a sergeant, I was able to take my car over. And I used to drive it down through town, and I made good friends with the Japanese people. The mayor was a good friend. The mayor's wife used to like to go for rides with me. And uh, the mayor would send her to go and ride, and he didn't want to go, but she always went. Get in the car, she'd get in the back seat, wanted the top laid back, and I would drive through the city, and she'd wave to all of his constituents. So <laughs> since she loved it, she took me to the, she took, took me all over the place, you know, just, and she was so popular. <laughs> and I was popular because of young sound, they, so I was there for about a year and a oh a year and a half on that in that town, and uh, I met one guy who was a very good friend of mine. His name was Yamamoto. Admiral Yamamoto was the one that started the war. He was a member of the Yamamoto family, and he was my best friend on Japan in Guam. I mean at uh, Hiranamachi. When we, my wife and I went back, when Jan and I went back 40 some years later, with tears in his eyes, he said, thanks for bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He says, if America had not done that, a lot more people, Americans and Japanese would have died because we were worshiping, worshiping a God. We would, we would have done anything. We never brought it up because over here, we were being criticized for having dropped those bombs on Hiroshima 
and Nagasaki. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I was pronouncing it in Japanese. But uh, uh, so we, we didn't bring it up. They brought it up in both cases. This was at the airport. He greeted us at the airport, this one. And those tears, he said, thank you for dropping bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Same thing. Wow, that was a devastating comment, contrary to what over here they were talking about. So how, how did you end up, I'm curious to hear the story of how you met Grandma. How did you end up in Utah and how did you meet her? When I came back to the States, because I had been on Guam, which was a remote assignment, you know, all villages off limits and all that kind of stuff for most of the time I was there. And in Japan, I was 200 miles north of Tokyo, a little radar site, 50 of us GIs, and that was considered remote also. Because I had two remote duty assignments, I was promised I could go to my state of choice wherever I wanted to go, whatever base I wanted to go to. So I was transferred, yes, to Florida. That's what I requested. Six weeks later, I'm still sitting in northern Florida at the base waiting for an assignment. They, they turned around and sent me to... Uh, this place called Utah. When I first went over to Guam on my first uh, troop ship, I stopped in Utah on 25th Street. The tr our train stopped for uh, two hours. And there I, I really was impressed. I was inspired. Something, I didn't know about inspiration then, but something told me that I was going to be back to that location again. And I thought, well, I never thought any more about it. Went to Guam, went to Japan, came back to the States. And I, just, I didn't know anything about the people out here at all. And so I was on the train coming from Florida, went, stopped in Cleveland. My mother was in Cleveland. My grandmother was in Cleveland. And both of them, my, mother's, my grandmother said, Alan, whatever you do, don't marry any of those Mormon girls out there. Mormons? What's a Mormon? You know? So anyway, they went through that. And... Uh, they hated Mormons. She did. And because uh, they were close to where it all started, you know, where there was a lot going on early on. And uh, so anyway, I went out to Utah and I found out about the Mormons. She, she, my grandmother had said they had horns. And uh, grandma, you know. And so, so anyway, they didn't have horns, and I learned to love the people of Utah. They were good people. I was invited into a lot of homes, met a lot of young women. Your ma, grandma, Jan, when she was in Utah State, she finished up her first year, and she came home for the, for the summer to make some more money to go back to Utah State. And when she came down here, she she took a test at a car, car sales place, and the car sales place wanted her to make, type up a letter, make a copy, a duplicate copy, and then that was the test to see if she was going to get the job. And, and so she failed the test because she did not know, even though she was trained in that field, she did not know that carbon paper, it didn't exist until just shortly before that. And carbon paper, she put it in the wrong way. And it typed the letter on the front and on the back because she put the carbon paper in backwards. And so she failed the test. So she decided to go to Hill Air Force Base and apply there for a job. Well, I was in the bomb wing headquarters. She was just arrived a little, a little small post exchange in uh, the bottom floor of the place where I was stationed on the third floor. And I had not been interested in marriage. I had not been interested in, I did a lot of dating and enjoyed the dating there, here in Utah. So one morning when she first got in there, she was walking over to a little snack bar across the on the other side of that floor, first floor. Uh, I, when I was walking down the stairs, I was with another GI, 
one of my buddies, <clears throat> and uh, I saw that I saw the, that girl down there. I asked my buddy to see that girl down there walking across there, and he said, "Yeah, I'm going to marry her." I never saw her before, never met her before. It was that's why I was sent back to Utah to marry your grandmother. Heavenly Father wanted me here. I married your grandmother 90 days later. We had 67 years of a fantastic marriage, r raising five, six, five wonderful kids. Six passed away early on. And then we had ended up with 20 grand, fantastic grandkids, but to, to grandma. So what was, what was your guys' dating courtship like during those 90 days? That's pretty fast. Every day, every single day. I was in the process of moving my job, and that's why they pulled me into the bomb wing headquarters. As a supply sergeant, I was to interview all of the supplies in this, all of the squadron supplies, make sure that they were all interviewed by the troops in those supplies and prepared for a move to Arkansas. It was a busy job. I was the only guy running. The, the, I had two, two officers. They just coordinated the thing, but I had to get it done. During the process, it, I was so busy and under so much pressure that uh, I ended up in the hospital. My job was so busy, and that was from stress. I just needed to break and relax. The officers brought the stuff over to me at the hospital to continue working in the hospital while I was relaxing, trying to get relaxed and so on. But I was dating every night. One day we even dated a, she decided she was going to break break the, the deal and not to break us up, but but she decided she was going to date somebody else. And so I says, okay, you go ahead and uh, enjoy your date. I'll get a date too. So I got a date that night too. And I went my way and she went her way. And the guy proposed to her while she was on her, while they were on their date. And she couldn't wait to get out of there. <laughs> And she couldn't wait to get back to good old Horace Allen Young. <laughs> so, so weeks later, we ended up being married. We were married, and uh, then we had to transfer to Florida because my, my tour was up. So we were stationed in Orlando. So, Did her parents have any concerns with you not being Mormon when you got married? No, not really. They they knew I was pretty independent, I guess, you know. By that time, I was about 25, you know, and uh, mature enough that I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, and that was really interesting. I, I know that was an inspired situation. You go. So you, uh, you guys moved out of state together. Um, what were... I guess adjusting to what were some of the challenges of of being married at the beginning was there any hard times? Not really. Oh, if we ever <clears throat> uh, if we ever have a little tip, I'd say you think you're so smart because you got a year of college and I'm a high school dropout. She's thinking, I got to get this guy a year of college. So I had an opportunity to move to Logan, Utah. I got, a, I got an assignment from Florida. We were there two years, and that's where I joined the church. And uh, we got an assignment to go to Utah State, and I would be on the faculty of the ROTC at Utah State. And uh, so we went at Utah State. They allowed me to take some schooling. Jan, the, but I said, well, Jan, I can't do it because I don't know, I only have 10 years of high school. She says, you can do it. I want you to sign up for classes. She helped me get my first three classes assigned. I signed up scared stiff. I went into the classes. I passed all three of them just fine. And... <laughs> 
And she was so happy because now she couldn't, I couldn't say, you think you're so smart because you got. <laughs> so she had a motive. She had a motive to get you more school. Yeah. <laughs> so you were, you were still in the military for a while after you guys got married. Right. 11 what, years. 11 more years after. Mm -hmm. So what were those 10, 11 years like you traveling? You got stationed all over the world. I got right? st stationed at Utah State. And I took the, got my first introduction to college. And then I was obsessed to get more college. And so I got, went to every base that we went to. We went to from, from Utah State. We went over to, back to Hillfield. Went to Hillfield, I took some classes. And I, I dropped out there. But then we went over to Europe. I took classes in Europe. Uh, with the ex extension service. And we were in Europe three years. We went down to Spain and took some classes down in Spain. And uh, uh, we were down there about three months. And uh, went back to Germany again and we got some more classes. So I took a lot of classes in Europe. I ended up going back to uh, Omaha, uh, Nebraska, to the University of Omaha at Nebraska, in Nebraska. And I got uh, authorization from the military to take get six, six months of uh, schooling to finish my degree, bachelor's degree. So, so the Air Force was really a blessing to me because I got, schooling was inex not very expensive for me because of that. So I, I picked up, uh, <clears throat> All of my credits I needed for a bachelor's. I was awarded a bachelor's degree degree in Omaha, <clears throat> Nebraska, Nebraska. Then it was time for retirement. They was sent me to, and then from there they sent me down to, Can to New Mexico. They were sent assigned me to Walker Air Force Base in, in New Mexico. And when I retired, I couldn't get a job because I had too much skill according to the 15 different letters I got back saying we can't afford to pay you enough because of your background. Since I couldn't get a job that way I just went ahead over to the college, 18 miles of the college and uh, that was Eastern New Mexico University and I decided I could probably teach with a bachelor's degree. I'm in all of my experience, so I should be able to teach. But when I went over there, the dean that interviewed me recognized that I probably had some potential, and he was thinking some stuff. And he he liked uh, he liked the idea of me staying at the university, and this is his thinking. And so he takes me over to another dean, dean of students on the campus. And they went in and had a discussion and decided I should stay on the campus. And I should take psychology courses, psychology program. So anyway, they offered me $1,900 to stay there and work with the foreign students, organize them. There were 18 of them on the campus then. And, uh, and then I would work on my psychology and I could get a master's degree in a year. I went and I worked on with them for a year, got my master's degree, and then uh, they offered me three dean positions. And uh, <clears throat> one of them was in Roswell, New Mexico, another challenge. They had a small base there that was closing, it closed down. It was no regular size base actually, but a small college, about 400 students downtown in an old post office building. I went ahead and, and moved down into Roswell, New Mexico, and I took the job. They offered me dean of students to, uh, I, w I would start up 13 departments. I had 13 departments. We had food service, we had the police department, we had the I was dean of students. I had uh, on and on. I had the, the activities the department. I had a big union building. So on the center of the base, 241 acres they gave to the university to create a university there, moving up from downtown. 
And uh, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> I did those, I did five years, and then somebody suggested I should go for a sabbatical. Well, while I was in Roswell, I also picked up another degree, an ed specialist degree. So I got a master's degree and I got an ed, ed specialist degree while I was there at, at, at the, at the uh, university, those five years. Then someone suggested I to take a sabbatical leave. And uh, so I decided to apply. I applied for a sabbatical leave. They gave me a year off to go to college. They paid me half pay while I was in college. <clears throat> so I went to University of New Mexico and to work on my doctorate. And that's where I finished up a doctorate. I did internships at four different hospitals down there in the psych departments of those hospitals. So I get experience. I got an offer of a job. One of the deans from our campus moved over to a local hospital on the, on the base. It was a brand new hospital that had been built before they closed the base. And so we moved over. So I was given an offer by this dean that moved over there. He says, Alan, why don't you come on over here? You can either be psychologist for the hospital or I can put you in the vocational division. We had a vocational division and a hospital division. I said, I'd like to be the psychologist for the hospital. So I was given the top psychologist job in the top three psychologists in the state of New Mexico. I was given that one of those positions. So I ended up with about 16,000 patients over the years as psychologists. These were with disabled patients. It was, <clears throat> and uh, there were people with spinal injuries, you know, strokes, uh, head traumas, amputees, on and on, any kind of problem. That, so I worked there for, I worked there for 13 and a half, 15 and a half years. And then I had 15 and a half years there and seven years with the college. So that was enough to retire from the state of New Mexico. So I retired from there. Two days later, I was offered the job to start over, at a, start a psychiatric unit which would be in the, in the St. Mary's Hospital downtown, uh, start the psychiatric hospital unit along with the drug and alcohol addiction unit. So I combined those two units as first, it was a first for a psychiatric unit being with drug and alcohol unit, and it worked. And so we had two years success, I had another 500 patients, and then they closed the hospital, and, it, and so, at that time, I had 42 years in the work field, and I decided to wind it up. That's when I retired, after those two years at the psychiatric and drug addiction and alcohol unit. Do you have any stories of living in Roswell? And um, oh, my mom told me stories growing up of aliens, extraterrestrials. I knew a thing. lot about that. What sort of experiences did you have? Well, uh, <clears throat> It really became a popular thing to talk about. When that airplane crashed, when that, that plane crashed, uh, it was interesting because when, they, when it first crashed, the next, that same time, as quickly as the newspaper came out, it announced the crash of a, one of these foreign objects. You know, they said that uh, it was a terrestrial and they had beings in it. There were human beings of some, some sort. And, uh, but then the guy that, was, that put that article in the paper was a military guy. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the next day, they received an order to rescind that totally. It never happened. It was, it was a weather balloon that crashed which was a lie, pure unadulterated lie. And uh, <clears throat> the Air Force was responsible for receiving all reports on different celestial, celestial beings and celestial outfits and whatever. But anyway, because there were bodies in the, there were five or six bodies, I don't remember the exact number, but because there were, then that meant that the people that were at the uh, 
plane or whatever needed to have a somebody from the mortuary go out because state law required morticians. Whenever a person died, the, they, the, they required morticians to go out to the plane or go out to wherever somebody died and they, they took over. <clears throat> they had to take the body, take it to the mortuary, examine it, take the blood out, you know, like they do with, uh, with people. And so uh, they did that. They went out there, but they would not allow them. They, they were invited to take caskets out there, child-sized caskets out to the plane. But uh, when they took them out there, they would not allow them to see the bodies. They would not allow them to get anywhere near them. They were told by a nurse to get out of there. They, she came out, she says, get out of there. You don't know anything, you don't see anything, leave the caskets and go. <clears throat> and so they, they complied, they left. We got reports that they shipped it to Fort Worth, Texas, and from Fort Worth, it went up to Ohio to uh, uh, research, be done research on it. But they did never admit that. The military never admitted that. Never admitted it went to Fort, Fort Worth. But there were people who knew that it went, did that. I had been branch president in Roswell for many years. And this was years, I mean, it took years before this, to, before this happened. It was, at first, they weren't talking about it, but later on, they started a lot of talk about it. And so I uh, decided that, that I'd check it out but, uh, because I had been branch president for quite a few years. I handled a number of funerals. I worked with those guys from the mortuary on the funerals. And I even helped dress uh, at least two uh, people in their temple clothing and stuff like that and for burial. And uh, so, and they admitted that it was real, and they admitted what had happened. So I knew a lot from them. Then I had a, when I was at the college, I had a fellow that was, he was military. He had been military. And he was at the base, and, but, he, and he was, he was, in the office where they re, where they made the statement that what had happened, so years later he told he told the, the public he got on the he got on the uh, TV he was became eighty years old or so he told the public what had really happened he says I was sworn to secrecy which was typical military you're sworn to secrecy and things you can't talk about it ever supposedly. And uh, I was sworn to secrecy. I was top secret holder because there were things that I was told for the same reason. I knew that when he reported it on TV that it was authentic because he was an honorable man. Gave us money every time we went out there to go give it to the kids at school. So anyway, it, it really happened. And the military for a long time until just only recently when they when they had uh, they came up with a new law, which required that they open up their records, and so the military is now releasing a lot of the facts that it really did happen. Well, there was a time in the church that we paid for helping to finance the churches, and we could do that with projects, or we could do it in cash. And so we did, we donated money and we also donated project in projects. Somebody had already in another project gone out and brought all this wood in from trees in the forest. Our job was to take that wood, cut it into segments so it could be used, sold as, as firewood. Uh, our whole team, they called on each priesthood quorum to bring in their guys, and I brought mine in. I was Elders Quorum President at the time. Got my troops out there, and, and uh, we had a... I was working with Vaughn. Vaughn was a teenager then. I was working with Vaughn, and he and I were working with a, a hydraulic axe. 
it was electrical. And we would place the wood on the stand and then the axe. We would bring the saw together and run through the wood and cut it into segments and, and restock it. Then the church would go ahead and their project next one would be to sell it. While we were splitting the wood, I looked down and I noticed on the ground there was something that looked weird. It was in a glove. Well, I had been wearing a glove. And my goodness, it was, it was a thumb. And I looked down, I, my thumb was gone. It wasn't bleeding. It was supposed to bleed, but it cauterized itself somehow. I don't know how it ever did that. So they took time to take to the military hospital. Well, the military hospital put my thumb in, a, cleaned it, put it in a bowl of salt water, and it was swishing around in there. And then they announced that they could not help me there because they didn't, they were not set to do some thumb surgery like that. They had, they were no hand doctors. So they took me to another hospital. We got to that hospital, that poor medic that was holding that bowl with my thumb, sloshing around. While we were still at the Air Force Base, so the doctor kept saying, Young, do you want some med uh, pain medication? No, I'm not having any pain. I'm not feeling any pain at all. And he said, you're still not bleeding. I said, yeah, I'm not bleeding and I have no pain. He asked me several times, you sure you don't want any medications for pain? Thank you, sir. No, I don't want any pain medication. So he took me to this other hospital and in that hospital they said, no, we're not going to be able to take care of you here either because uh, we just don't have the ability to uh, repair thumbs here. So, so they then sent me to another hospital and this poor medic, I, 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 I was thinking he's probably gonna, <laughs> probably gonna throw up in that pot. <laughs> he looked green, he was, he was kind of a young new medic and so I didn't laugh. <laughs> But anyway, I still was cauterized, nothing bleeding, and I was no pain still. They kept trying to feed me pain pills, but I never never took any. So we ended up to a Presbyterian hospital in Albuquerque, and they had two hand surgeons on hand, Dr. Brown and Dr. Herhan, and uh, they wanted to experiment and go ahead and put, try to put the thumb back on. So. They, so they did, they operated for five hours on his thumb, trying to get it back into uh, where it would regrow. So they did, they, they, were, they sewed it on, and then we were at Christmas break at college. I was at BYU, I was at University of New Mexico in Albuquerque at the time working on my doctorate. And uh, it was Christmas break, so I asked them if I could, uh, I would have missed a few classes, and and they said, no, it's okay, you go ahead and take your extended break and go out and visit your family. So we went up to Utah, came up here, stayed for the Christmas holidays, went back down, but it was starting to, obviously it was starting to die. So it died, and uh, then they had to operate again, take it off, and they could not put that back on. So they just sewed it up. And, uh, but then they, they had a spike that came, broke through there, a bone spike, they called it a bone spur, came through. So they had to open it up again and take that bone spur out and smooth it all around. And that's what they did, but they had gone real deep into the hand. You can see here these scars. And they took a piece of skin from here and Put it, wrapped it around there and let it regrow. And uh, so when it stuck and I've been able to, and I was given a blessing saying that I would have full use of the restoration of my hand. And uh, which was weird, you know, but, but not really because you have extension 
which I would not have had extension. It would have been really difficult if I hadn't, if they hadn't cut through here into my hand and they made a thumb out of this lower part of my hand, of my thumb. And so, so that's that story. Isn't that sad? <laughs> it hasn't bothered me. I have been able to do everything. I know of nothing. Every, there's been occasionally I, I thought that I wasn't able to do something, but then I'd fiddle around with it just to show myself that I could do it. <laughs> I, could, I could do everything with it. And I do have restoration. And I have opposition. Same just as like the land. Kids over the years, every new kid in the family, everyone, every new one, we got a bunch of kids in the family, every single one of them would test, want to see my thumb. And I would always grab them on a wrist. And there was no way they could get away. <laughs> there was no way they could get away. And so it became a historical thing, I guess, to, to be able to want to see grandpa's thumb. <laughs> and Jackie was, she, she was a precious baby, really a good baby. And so we, 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 you know, played and had fun together and that sort of thing, you know, so. One thing I really enjoyed over the years since they were in the States, all the time they were in the States, every visit was wonderful. We really had great experience. It was, a, she was so loving and caring and, and she seemed to really enjoy her family, us. She loves kids. And every time I'd visit with her, she was always involved, helping, loving, caring for kids. She worked in an, in an organization that was very involved with helping kids grow. And so I really appreciated that. I thought that was wonderful. Probably after he came to the States, uh, that was good because he he uh, enjoyed coming out to my work. He he enjoyed coming out there and and visiting and just playing around and having fun. And uh, when we visited him, he, we were always treated royally. He always treated me as you know he's happy to be me being his dad. And he has got a personality like the Youngs. He's friendly. He really likes people. It really is pleasant to be part of the family. I, I'm really happy that that uh, things have settled down in their lives and we just became friends, you know. And then that worked out really nicely. Well, when David came home from his, well, he, as a kid, when he was very young, every time we, he saw on a cereal box, he could order a magic thing. And so he had his mother order the magic thing for him. And uh, he'd play with that. And when we'd go to other cities, we'd, he'd want to stop at a magic store. And uh, he would uh, buy one article, one thing of magic. So anyway, he did that a number of times. And, and pretty soon he got pretty good at doing some magic. And, and then he went off to college well, while he was in Roswell, he took a class, and he got a whole stack of books on the scholars involved in magic over many, many years. And uh, he, st he took the class with uh, Jonel Witt, who was a really good friend of ours, and, and uh, he, uh, uh, he really in uh, enjoyed doing that, that class because he did a directed study then of all those books, he studied them, and he really knew the field of magic. And so he developed his magic. While he was in Roswell, we even let him do a show there in Roswell at the college, and he did a beautiful performance at the college. So anyway, magic was his big thing, and he enjoyed it, and he's always, all of our kids were good, good kids and responsible. But, uh, but David went on his mission, and then he came back, and I helped uh, get him shows all over the Western United States. And, and uh, he got and, uh, in Roswell, and 
and in Texas. And, and uh, so anyway, he did his shows. He always, well, when he came back from magic, from, uh, from overseas, he, all, he had learned while he was over there on this mission how to blow fire. I think he blew it about six or eight feet out of his mouth. And so he actually won the top award in Australia of all musicians had a meeting and they did their performances and he won the top award for his performance in that magic uh, uh, meeting of all those magicians in Australia. Dave, that was David and then Pam, uh, Pam really, really had a tough time. She, she had bad asthma from birth and uh, but she was determined, really determined. And she was not, got to, went to the doctors locally in Roswell. Doctors would cut her off on foods and stuff. Pretty soon she wasn't eating anything and she was really suffering. And I, I had to resuscitate her at least a couple of times uh, and as she was growing in her teenage years. So we had an opportunity to send her up to Colorado, uh, to Colorado to Nazareth Hospital, National Jewish. And they were, they were scholars and working with different conditions like hers. And uh, they were able to get her eating anything, eliminated the need for all those uh, claims of allergies to foods. And uh, she, she did beautifully up there. She was up there seven months. It was sad to see her go, sad to have her gone. But she was there for seven months and she did beautifully up there. And she was supposed to have stayed a year. She did so well, they let her come back in seven months. She, uh, all of our kids are, in, a, I, in my estimation, are somewhat hyper. They just accomplish a lot of stuff. They are all accomplishers. And she, and then she's been involved nationally on, in politics and she's done beautifully with, she's, invited back and forth to Washington on a regular basis, to Washington, D.C. And so anyway, that Pam, she excelled in the, the, those kind of things. All the kids were good moms to their kids. And then Lori, Lori is really talented in arts. And uh, she, she's really skilled in just about everything that she does. And she does, she's been, she's probably, Oh, it's exciting to see her progress. And she did probably well over 150 movies. And you kids and some other kids in the family have actually been on her sets. I've been on her sets 13 times, you know, doing, performing some part, some little thing on, the, on her set. And, uh, but she was skilled with the hair and the, and the face, working with both. She could do, she did uh, Indians crossing all the way across the country uh, that went uh, through the Columbia River. Uh, but she, she was able to do the different Indian hair makeups and facial expressions and looks uh, on all the Indians going across the, the uh, uh, that was the, where Pocahontas went uh, on that trip. So uh, she was really skillful in those areas. And then Vaughn, <clears throat> Uh, Vaughn was really very active and involved in a lot of things, and uh, he was skillful what he did. He also went on a mission in uh, California, and uh, he was able to. Uh, he was so he was so good in no, with his knowledge of of the scriptures and knowledge of the gospel that he uh, he in his faith that is tough for conversions really. He was able to bring into the church over 50 people uh, while he was out on his mission because he was so knowledgeable. And, and he's been friends with some of the missionaries that were, went out and some of the people that, uh, that uh, he converted. Two of them went on missions shortly after they were converted into the church. And, uh, but he was, he was very active in sports. He was a good good wrestler, he loved wrestling, and that really helped Vaughn give him his, uh, build his ego, to, he was a winner in, in that. 
And uh, well, Christy, she's another one of the hypers. She's into everything. She's she's on the go all the time. She's never happy unless she's accomplishing something. And uh, she's was a master at the creation of four kids. And uh, she did a really nice job with the, the parenting of her kids, like all the other kids did as well. But uh, she did well in school and in college, and all of them went on and got degrees in college and, uh, and uh, worked hard in school. Now they don't push college as much. They push more of the, of the uh, non-traditional academics, the uh, uh, working in the field and, and that way, learning the skills. But, uh, but they did well as they went through, through their school. They all achieved after they finished in raising of their kids. They've all been successful. David is the mayor of the city of Orem, and which is quite an achievement. And uh, so basically that's a little bit about each kid. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I'm curious to hear um, about some of your favorite family family traditions, maybe just family get-togethers and the kind of things we would do here, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I really, I really enjoy getting together with family. Even as late as this Christmas, we're going to get together here in Roswell, I mean in Orem, and uh, we're Christmas Eve. And uh, I love the idea, I've always felt it was good for the cousins to get together build relationship with the relationship with each other, get to know each other as cousins. I think that's so important in the development of the kids. And uh, they learn social skills. Nowadays they live in high rises and the only place to play is maybe a dog compound like the ones they're building over at Costco here in Orem, Utah. They got all those high rises, got one place that has grass, and that's where they take the dogs. But there's no place for the kids to be socialized and get interact. We used to, and before the high rises, when you owned homes, kids could play in the backyard and run and romp and play, and we did it And when I was a boy. we. We got together with the different farmers' kids, and we just really loved having those relationships. And uh, so uh, I think that that was really special to me to see the kids interact and, and active. That's why I always like to have parties here at the house. That's why I look forward to this what, Christmas, you know, and getting together as a family. Um, how have the past couple of years been with you and grandma moving to Jamestown? What has that experience been like? Well, it became necessary because I was doing okay. I did have a light dose of COVID, but I took the treatment and prevented it from getting really bad. We've always been pretty healthy. We've been blessed. I've, I've had problems health-wise physically, but uh, none to put me out of business, but Jen had really struggled. She, she fell 15 times one time. Christy and I picked her up off the floor that many times in one day. But that very day she was trapped in a door. She fell in the doorway of the bathroom and we couldn't get a hold of her to, to, to pick her up and bring her out of that so we had to call the professionals. We called, her, and they put took her to the hospital. And she ended up going into. A, she. It was just miserable to watch her suffer. And uh, so in the hospital they treated her, and then they had her go into a rehab hospital, or rehab units, and she spent thirty twenty eight thirty days in the rehab. And to, to watch her working out and really suffering and and uh, see her decline like she did, uh, uh, <laughs> it 
Anyway, she survived uh, going into the rehab like she did, but it was tough. And then it wasn't very long later that she fell again, and she had to go into another rehab and had to go through the same suffering all over again. That was tough. That was when someone suggested we'd take a look at Re at going into an assisted living where she could get help from the med techs and the, the uh, workers at, the, at a, a unit like that. We checked out several units and she agreed it was, she needed it. And so we went ahead and, and looked at several places and we found that Jamestown was number one. That was the best for us. They had activities all day long. They had activities in the evening. People came in from out of, out of, out of Jamestown, volunteered to do programs of different kinds, musicals, dramas, all kinds of activities. And we had movies on a regular basis if we could go to if we wanted to. So those kind of things are good for you to keep from getting monotonous, becoming monotonous. And uh, so uh, we moved over to uh, Jamestown Rehab and uh, she, she, not rehab, she uh, assisted living. And uh, it worked out really good. The food was good over there. We had, she didn't have to worry about cooking food and preparing food. She didn't have to worry about cleaning the house. She didn't have to worry about anything except just get the most out of life that she could get at the time. Nonetheless, it was a tough time. So I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful that we did it. I'm gra grateful. And it was so good. I was only going to stay over there th three months and she'd be better off and she would come home. But no, it wasn't going to happen. Four months, well, it was July. We got in there in March and in July 12th, uh, she passed. And... Uh, the stinker up there and right now is making me cry. <laughs> so anyway, that's how we ended up in Jamestown. That was a tough time. What were some of your favorite things about Grandma? She was super intelligent. She probably would, her dad was probably an IQ of 140 to, you know, I measured IQs as a psychologist. And uh, she, I didn't measure theirs, I didn't measure hers, but I didn't have to. I knew that they were way up there, probably 140, 145 or so. Very, very intelligent, but loaded with common sense. She had not only intelligence, but she had common sense to boot. She knew what was good for the kids in raising them. She taught all the kids. They would, if they came in late at night uh, from their dates, I'd already be in bed because I had to get up early in the morning. And uh, she'd sit down with them and she'd shoot the breeze with them and answer their questions, answer their concerns. And, uh, and if they had a question about the gospel because they'd run into challenges from people in New Mexico that had questions about the gospel. And so the, so she would give them clarification. She'd go to the scriptures and she'd pull up whatever they, whatever answer she was, they were looking for. And Vaughn especially spent a lot of time with her that way. And uh, so, uh, and she did, she, she had us uh, come to dinner at a certain time in the evening, sometimes for me, I was a little bit late or something like that because I also had a private practice as well as a hospital practice. So I was busy with patients and doing evaluations sometimes in the evening, but the kids 
admit that they, I was around enough that they didn't ever miss me because I was gone too much. But, uh, but I was very busy to taking care of patients and, and stuff like that. But she's, uh, she, was, she was really good in defending me and uh, she knew how to deal with the public because she was well trained. She got her master's degree in psychology also. She, she knew, uh, uh, she, I got a lot of phone calls and she knew how to deal with the people that, because I was branch president and, and bishop in Roswell while the kids were growing up. And so I was busy a lot with that as well as my hospital practice, my private practice and doing psychological evaluations and that sort of thing, you know, so. But she, uh, she always backed me up and always wanted to, when we first got married, I'd been nine years without a Christmas tree, worrying about a Christmas tree. She, we were in Germany and she says, let's get a Christmas tree. Well, we didn't have a lot of money. And I says, well, maybe we should just pass this year until we build up our funds a little bit. And, uh, no, this happened in Ro this happened in Roswell, and uh, it was not in Germany. It was in Roswell, and so anyway, uh, she says, and she looked sad. So I said, "Well, maybe we'll just get a little one or something. We'll get a Christmas tree." So we went and got our first Christmas tree in Roswell, and uh, uh, <laughs> it's kind of kind of puny, but I, but it was not, in fact, I went and got the tree and it was really, I felt sorry for the tree because it wasn't all that pretty a tree. It was a little bit ugly. <laughs> she thought it was ugly and, but she picks it up with. <laughs> You're being tough. <laughs> So anyway, she she was just good all around. She always faithful and always uh, backing me with the work that I had to do, the schooling I had to do. I mean, I did that schooling all while I was raising kids, you know, first two kids when I was in college. So that first time. So, but she wanted me to go through it. She pushed me all the way. She didn't have to, I was addicted. You know, I just started and I found that I could learn and I learned well and I, and, uh, and, and then I took those at least 50 training programs. I counted 20, 50 of them. Then I saw a long list of them and uh, so I'd made it over the years and, and like I was trained in doing hypnosis and trained in doing this and that and the other thing. And, uh, group therapy and special therapies and stuff like that. So, but she she really was very supportive all the way through our entire lives, you know. So, and we covered eighty five countries, and because she liked to travel like I did, and uh, we took a lot of groups. We took groups all over the world. We did it so that not because we just necessarily love taking the groups. We loved travel. We loved to go into different countries and and see how people lived in different countries and and uh, and we did that. We saw uh, we took the groups and the nice thing about it was that we got for every people eight people we took seven or eight people we took we got a free trip and so so we we took a lot of free trips and but we covered. The Pacific, the Atlantic, the Caribbean, all over the world. So, so anyway, it was a, a good experience. You guys covered a lot of ground together. Yeah, we did. You turned ninety four this year, right? Uh, no, I am ninety. Oh, I turned ninety four, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, what's maybe the one or two things that you're most proud of in your life? A lot of things I'm real proud of. Proud of the way our my wife has been as a good, great wife. Proud of my kids because they've turned out good. 
and they've done well, and they raised their families well, taught their families well. It was important for them to be close to their families and taught them well. And uh, the moms have all been outstanding. The dads have all been out, have, have both been outstanding. Uh, proud of that. Proud of our grandkids because you all have turned out really well. You're achieving, you're doing, you're motivated, you're driving, you're, you're getting things done that need to be accomplished. You're leaving your mark on the world. And that's important. Uh, you're you're uh, also very patriotic. All of our kids are flying flags in front of their houses. To me, that's perfect. That's wonderful. That's why I served in three wars. Didn't have to get into combat, but I made sure that the troops had this equipment. What advice would you have for me or Tanner or the rest of our cousins? Just live good lives. And as you're, you're often on the right way to doing the right things in the right places at the right times, continue to be motivated to move forward. Continue to accomplish things. Be good citizens. Remember America's worth saving. But I think just it's important to live good lives. Be good people. I think we're good. We've answered all my questions. <laughs> How long were we at it? How long did we go? <clears throat> two, two and a half hours. You're serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> it didn't seem like it. <laughs> yeah, going down memory lane. And you made me ball. <laughs> hey, it wasn't me, it was the question. It was Grandma. <laughs> yeah, I'm convinced that those stinkers upstairs, they're doing some they're they're messing involved with in you. this. Even my mother got involved in it. Your mom? Yeah. Her, even, and, her and Grandma are working together? Yeah, they are. Yeah, we. Ha uh, my patriarchal blessing says that I would have more than one guardian angel. I so I had at least two to start, and then when 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 Lori and I went and baptized my sister about two months ago, that was the most spiritual experience I've had in a lot of years. Uh, she, she was so happy to be a member of the of the church, so. But back then, she said, uh, she says, your sister's up there, too. You got a, they got a team. They're really picking on me. And they, uh, but, you know, I can, I can say my prayers, and automatically I get help, you know, to try to sleep longer or something like that. I've become very good friends with the folks upstairs. You know, they're good well, I think we covered everything. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming over and doing this. Yeah, you bet. So yeah, I've got a lot of editing to do. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. But yeah, there's a lot of those stories that I just wanted to get on video and have the official versions of. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to repeat them because they're 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 good stories. A lot of them are really interesting stories and I've had an interesting life. Yeah. You've really. seen a lot of you've seen a lot of change. Yeah. Going from sharing bath water with your siblings. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh yeah, those are fine memories. <laughs> that really is funny. That's yeah. good.